You know what I'm saying? He's maybe an inch or so, or maybe an inch to half an inch shorter than Olivier Vernon. But all of them get to play DN, and he's forced to play linebacker? I think he's a stand-up edge rusher who we are playing out of position because we don't we've been so inadequate at recruiting linebacker that a DN can come here and be the best linebacker on the team. Yeah. Now well, is that that's speaking about him and this program. Yeah. To the point where you see a guy like Corey Flagg Jr. is one of the only true linebackers on the freaking roster. Oh yeah, I know. And, and look and, at how well he played. Yeah, and he, he immediately yeah, he immediately separated himself as a 19-year-old. That, that doesn't even make sense. That should not be a thing. Agreed. We, so, because we had 56, 55, and 53, we stopped recruiting big time. You bring in a project player like B.J. Jennings. You bring in a so-so player like Wayman Steed. Instead of going after some big dogs. Who was in direct correlation with that? Manny Diaz. Yeah. So that's why I keep saying linebacker will forever be a question mark for me because he has had his hand on that since 2016, yeah. and it has been one of the worst positions in college football. Yeah, and, and you know, with that, just just another side note is that, you know, when, when Manny got here, all him and Mark Richt had to do was just, re- like, reassure the commitment of Pinckney, uh, Quarterman, and Zach McLeod because they were all committed and very interested under Al Golden as well. So, you know, it, it's hard to even call them Manny Diaz recruits, really. And, you know, those are undoubtedly the best guys that, that have played under Manny, a linebacker, and, you know, we saw how that went there last year. And if we're being honest, they were brought here to play in that Mark Diafano 34. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Shaq was going to be the middle in the 3 4. Pinkney was going to be the weak side in the 3 4. McLeod was going to be the strong side outside linebacker in the 3 4. People forget that. McLeod, That's no. why him transitioning to, to DN is going to be the best thing that happened to him in his yeah. career. Yeah. I, I, that's what he was going to be brought here to do is yeah. to cover alley flats and rush the passer. I was just going to say, man, like. Zach McLeod's career would have gone a lot differently if he would have come here to play in a in a three four defense. No, I'm I'm definitely not for the for the three four at Miami anymore. Yeah. Well, I like the thirty four. I played in it. Uh, the three four can be ultra aggressive. Yeah. yeah. But the way that Diafano was coaching it, it's not because I mean, you turn on Alabama, they are three four mm-hmm. nickel team. You turn on Georgia, they are 3-4, nickel team. Auburn, 3-4, nickel team. Ohio State, 3-4, nickel team. Yeah, I, I, you know, yeah, I think it's funny that everyone always disses on the 3-4, and I'm like, that's, that's what Saban's been running at Alabama since the day he got there. I don't know. It's kind of it, it, it's funny. I know you're a, you're, you're a lineman guy. A, a lot of people are – are worried about this defensive line because we lose uh, Jalen Phillips, Quincy, uh, Quincy Roche. I guess you could throw Greg Rousseau in there, but I am so excited. Um, and I love coach Todd Stroud. I think he's one of the the good men to, to be coaching at this uh, university in a long time. Um, and he's still involved with the program very much so, but I love that Jess Simpson is back coaching at Miami because I, I saw what his 2018 defensive line did, and it was it was outstanding what he did with Joe Jackson, Jonathan Garvin, Gerald Willis. Do you think that we could see that same kind of production from this line with guys like Nesta Silvera, Jafari Harvey, Zach McLeod, and DeAndre Johnson? I think it could be even better as a collective unit. I've been – I've spoken – I don't know Coach Tal Stroud. I know the players love him. I know he's renowned as a person. But at the end of the day, we're talking football. And the D-line made a huge regression as a unit under Coach Tal Stroud. Take it how you want. I, 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 that's just facts. I don't really care. That's just the truth. Okay? Our young men were not working moves. Our young men were not being prepared. Our young men were not aggressive. Our young men were not disengaging. All of that type of stuff will be changed under Coach Simpson. You will not touch his football field if you cannot disengage from a guard. You will not touch his football field if on third down all you're doing is bull rushing. That stuff is unacceptable. It's it's, uh, it's unacceptable. And you can hear the inflection in my voice because you're talking about a a position that is personal for me as a player and a coach. 
And that has been the most underwhelming crap I've seen in the last two years under the recent defensive line coach. If we're talking ball strictly, like I say, I'm not attacking him as a person. I don't know him as a person. But his production on that freaking defensive line has been unacceptable at the University of Miami on every on every level. Unacceptable. All right. Okay. okay. I'll, so I'll, I'll, I, I do think that Coach Simpson is going to change everything about this crap I've seen at defensive line at the University of Miami. He's going to change it. Okay. Us backdooring plays. And then, so so you got linebackers who fill gaps, and then you have D linemen who backdoor plays. No, that doesn't that doesn't work. That doesn't make any logical sense. Okay, so you got the two people who are responsible for that crap out of this program. That's Blake Baker and Coach Todd Stroud as on football field, on field coach. Okay, so the D line is going to play completely different. Now, I'm not saying they're going to go out there and have 37 sacks as a D line. Period. I would love that. But just from the philosophy of how they're going to play, it's going to be completely different. Okay. So, so if you ask me right now, my starting four on the D-line would – would I, I change this a lot, but after hearing you know what I've heard you know being in the Skype interviews with the players and coaches, this would be my starting four. It would be Jafari Harvey, Nesta, Jared Harrison Hunt, and Zach McLeod. Would you agree with that? And where are they at? Strong side, weak side, three technique, two eye. Talk to me. What, what's going on here? Well, I, you tell me. I don't know. That, that, the, the X's and O's, that's your thing, man. Okay. So so based on the line you just gave me, you would have to have Jafari Harvey on the weak side and Zach McLeod on the strong side. Number one, Jafari Harvey is a little bit more of a pass rusher than he is a, bal- a balanced player. He can stop the run. I'm not saying he can't. But for what he does best, you want him on the weak side where he doesn't really have to worry about the run. He can just get out there the QB. Zach McCow, I, I I don't know him as a D in what he can work. I know that he's pretty stout against the run coming downhill, so you would want that on your strong side. Now you got Nesta and Harrison Hunt. You got two pass rushers in at D tackle. Who's stopping the run, Marsh? Uh, I don't know. Uh, who's who's going to get double teamed by a guard? Be able to anchor and not get blown back to our small linebackers. Please tell me. So are you saying we don't have that guy? What I'm saying is that's either going to have to be 96 or 91. Either one of them is going to have to wake up and show me something. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, if you're talking about a, a third down D-line, that's pretty good. But yeah. you got okay, Nasty okay. Nasty who's balanced. You have Harrison Hunt who's a little bit more pass rush than he is run stop. So he's technically balanced, but he leans pass rush. What happens when you go up against guards who are just going to double team and blow you up? So you so you say put uh, Harrison Hunt in and pass in passing situations. Yes, for me, my starting D line, I would keep those uh, those same DNs because I think seniority is going to have McLeod start over Johnson, who I think Johnson is way better. But they're going to start McLeod. He's he's yep. one of Manny's guys, so they're going to keep milking him until he's done. <laughs> um, so you're going to have Zach McLeod on the strong side, Harvey on the weak side. Give me Nesta Silvera as a three technique and give me uh, John Ford as a two eye. Okay. All right. Do you think, do you think, do you think as the season progresses, we could see uh, possibly Leonard Taylor get some snaps? Absolutely. I mean, he's already pushing like 305, 306. Last time I looked into one of his tweets, he talked about how much weight he's gained. He's going to have something to say. And the thing about college ball at the highest level, it's not really about about starts anymore. It's about snap count mm-hmm. and situational ball, and that's the same. You can say that about every single position, excluding O line, unless you put a you know you got a marquee freshman, you put him in at tight end on goal line and just help move people. That helps. Yeah. Or TV, you need one guy. But you saw last year with a running back, you can use all three and be successful. Okay, I wish we had that mentality at wide receiver because we would have had a way better outcome to the season if we used people all over instead of just forcing three or four on the field because they're the older guys. When it comes to D-line, shoot, you keep everybody's snap count under 20, you keeping everybody healthy, you're rotating, you got a NASCAR, which is your third down D-line, you got your starting front, you got your run stop in front, you have your balanced fronts. Oh, man. You match up, like, let's say, for example, this Pitt. Let's say we're playing Pitt, and Pittsburgh has this really weak right guard and pass blocking. 
So you make sure that week you start Nesta at the two eye. You bring in a Harrison Hunt or a Leonard Taylor at three technique because they're going to eat this guy's lunch all day on passing downs. That's the type of foresight I wasn't seeing the last two years that I know I will see under a pro D line coach and Coach Simpson. Okay. Well, wholesome. So I uh, I want to talk about O line now. Oh, and- I love. It. I love it. Hit me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, you know, there, there's a lot of rhetoric around the idea that, you know, we returned every offensive lineman. We should have, you know, this should be a strength for our team. Now, we've talked enough that you kind of know how I am, right? Like, I, I'm always someone who I see the way that everyone's cutting it, and I try to take a cut in a different direction, Right. And so, so what I, I, I would like you to try to talk me off the edge if, if that's your opinion. But, you know, two years ago, 2019, we have most of the same personnel. Um, and we are in the 110s, 120s as far as rankings for an offensive line. We change coaches. We all, you know, everyone matures another year. Last year, we're in the 90s still. Um, so I am hesitant. I, I think there will be considerable improvement. But there is a lot of room for considerable improvement when you are 90th. Um, so I am predicting, you know, relative to those rankings, I'm predicting a fairly mediocre offensive line next year. So I'm thinking like 50s to 60s. Um, I agree. Okay. Okay. So so you're not on on board of the, you know, just because they're all seniors, we're going to have a great offensive line. No. Uh, let me ask you a question. I'll pose this question to you. You know, the the greatest scale in South Florida, do you know it by any chance? It's a little different than every other Uh, greatest scale. No. Okay. So zero to 59 is an F in in South Florida. I've I've been around other places, so I know that the greatest scale is a little different. Okay. Then you go from 60 to 69 is a D, 70 to 79 is a C, okay, and so on and so Mm -hmm. on. 80 to 89 is a B, mm-hmm. and 90 up is an A. Right. Let's say, for example, you are a 47F, right? And you work your behind off, and you climb all the way up to a 60D. Mm-hmm. Is that still great? <laughs> no. But you spent all this time, you know the system, you know the class, you're doing really well, you worked really hard. You climb from a super F to basically an F plus D minus. <laughs> I get you. I get where you're going. Okay. okay. So this, this offensive line is going to have an influx of Navon Donaldson, which we all know if, he, if all reports are to be true, he's really taking a step forward. We know for a fact he's going to be a huge influx in the run game. I mean, as much as I love DJ Scaife, you got DJ Scaife moving people or Navon Donaldson moving people. Who do you think is going to move someone a little further? Navon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> At right tackle, now you're going to have a little fire under Jerry Williams behind because he was a guy who just made sure his player didn't make the play. He didn't plan anybody. He didn't move anybody. He didn't pick anybody up and move them to the outside linebacker. Now, I'm not saying you got to be blindside and, and Michael Orr and drive somebody to the bus, but our O-line doesn't put people in the dirt. They just get in the way. So, uh, do, you, do, you, do you think this is that, that like, our, defic- our deficiencies at offensive line, do you think that's more coaching or just lack of talent? Ah, Marsh, that's a tough question because I think balance is super important in life and it's going to be a little bit of both on both sides of that argument. Okay. Here's why I say that. You take, let's take a guy like Cleveland Reed, right? How is it that this guy goes from being a four star and I believe he was a top 15 in his position in the country and now he can't even crack any PT on a 90th rank O line in the country. Suspicious. Hmm. <laughs> or or you, you bring in a guy like Ja'Kai Clark, who is 
obviously the best center on the team. 